Section number 20 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott from 1686 to 1698, Part 3. It was hardly to be expected that the New England colonies would let such raids pass unpunished. The destruction of Schenectady had been bad enough. The massacre of Salmon Falls caused the New Englanders to forget their jealousies for once and to unite in a common cause. All the colonies agreed to contribute men, ships, and money to invade New France by land and sea. The land forces were placed under Winthrop and Schuller, but as smallpox disorganized the expeditions before it reached Lake Champlain, the attack by land had little other effect than to draw Frontenac from Quebec down to Montreal, where Captain Schuller, with Dutch bushmen, succeeded in ravaging the settlements and killing at least twenty French. The expedition by sea was placed under Sir William Phipps of Massachusetts, a man who was the very antipodes of Frontenac. One of a poor family of twenty-six children, Phipps had risen from being a shepherd boy in Maine to the position of ship's carpenter in Boston. Here, among the harbor folk, he got wind of a Spanish treasure ship containing a million and a half dollars worth of gold, which had been sunk off the West Indies. Going to England, Phipps succeeded in interesting that same clique of courtiers who had helped Radisson to establish the Hudson's Bay Company, Abermile and Prince Rupert and the King, and when, with funds which they had advanced, Phipps succeeded in raising the treasure vessel he received, in addition to his share of the booty, a title and the appointment as governor of Massachusetts. Here then was a daring leader chosen to invade New France. Phipps sailed first for Port Royal, which had in late years become infested with French pirates preying on Boston commerce. Word had just come from the fearful massacres of colonists at Portland. Boston was inflamed with a spirit of vengeance. The people had appointed days of fasting and prayer to invoke heaven's blessing on their war. When Phipps sailed into Annapolis Basin with his vessels and seven hundred men in the month of May, he found the French commander, Meneville, ill of the gout with garrison of about eighty soldiers, but all the cannon chanced to be dismounted. The odds against the French did not permit resistance. Meneville stipulated for an honorable surrender, all property to be respected and the garrison to be sent to some French port. But no sooner were the English in possession than, like the French at Portland, they broke the pledge. There was no massacre as in Maine, but plunderers ran riot, seizing everything on which hands could be laid, ransacking houses and desecrating the churches, and sixty of the leading people, including Meneville and the priests, were carried off as prisoners, leaving one English flag flying. Phillips sailed home. Indignation at Boston had been fanned to fury, for now all the details of the butchery at Portland were known and Phipps found the colony mustering a monster expedition to attack the very stronghold of French power, Quebec itself. England could afford no aid to her colonies, but thirty-two merchant vessels and frigates had been impressed into the service, some of them carrying as many as forty-four cannon. Artisans, sailors, soldiers, clerks, all classes had volunteered as fighters, to the number of twenty-five hundred men, but there was one thing lacking. They had no pilot who knew the St. Lawrence. Full of confidence, born of inexperience, the fleet set sail on the ninth of August, commanded again by Phelps. Time was wasted ravaging the coasts of Gaspé. 
holding long-winded councils of war, arguing in the commander's stateroom instead of drilling on deck. Three more weeks are wasted poking about the lower St. Lawrence, picking out chance vessels off Tadoussac and Anticosti. Among the prize vessels taken near Anticosti was one of Joliet's, bearing his wife and mother-in-law. The ladies delighted the hearts of the Puritans by the news that not more than one hundred men garrisoned Quebec, but Phipps was reckoning without his host, and his host was Frontenac. Besides, it was late in the season, the middle of October, before the English fleet rounded the island of Orleans and faced the citadel of Quebec. Indians had carried word to the city that an Englishwoman, taken prisoner in their raids, had told him more than thirty vessels had sailed from Boston to invade New France. Frontenac was absent in Montreal. Quickly the commander at Quebec sent couriers with warning to Frontenac, and then set about casting up barricades in the narrow streets that led from lower to upper town. Frontenac could not credit the news. He had not heard here in Montreal from Indian couriers how the English overland expedition lay rotting of smallpox near Lake Champlain, such pitiable objects that the Iroquois refused to join them against the French. New France now numbered a population of 12,000 and could muster 3,000 fighting men, and though the English colonies numbered 20,000 people, how could they, divided by jealousies, send an invading army of 2,700, as the rumor stated? Frontenac, grizzled old warrior, did not credit the news, but all the same he set out amid pelting rains by boat for Quebec. Halfway to Three Rivers, more messengers brought him word that the English fleet were now advancing from Tadoussac. He sent back orders for the commander at Montreal to rush the bushrovers down to Quebec, and he himself arrived at the Citadel just as Le Moy brothers anchored below Cape Diamond from a voyage to Hudson Bay. Miracourt Le Moy reported how he had escaped past the English fleet by night, and it would certainly be at Quebec by daybreak. Scouts rallied the bush rangers on both sides of the St. Lawrence to Quebec's aid. Frontenac bade them guard the outposts and not desert their hamlets, while St. Helene and the other Lemoys took command of the sharpshooters in Lower Town, scattering them in hiding along the banks of the St. Charles and among the houses facing the St. Lawrence below Castle St. Louis. Sure enough, at daybreak on Monday, October 16th, sail after sail, 34 in all, rounded the end of Orleans Island and took up position directly opposite Quebec City. It was a cold, wet autumn morning. Fog and rain alternately chased in gray shadows across the far hills, and above the mists of the river loomed ominous the red-gray fort which the English had come to capture. Castle St. Louis stood where Chateau Frontenac stands today, and what is now the promenade of a magnificent terrace was at that time a breastwork of cannon extending on down the sloping hill to the left as far as the ramparts. In fact, the cannon of that period were more dangerous than they are today, for long-range missiles have rendered old-time fortifications adapt for close-range fighting almost useless, and the cannon of Upper Town, Quebec, that October morning swept the approach to three sides of the fort, facing the St. Charles, opposite Point Levis and the St. Lawrence, where it curves back on itself, and the fourth side was sheer wall, invulnerable. With a rattling of anchor chains and a creaking of masts, the great sails of the English fleet were lowered, and a little boat put out at ten o'clock under flag of truce to meet a boat halfway from Lower Town. Phipps' messenger was conducted blindfold up the barricaded streets leading to Castle St. Louis, and the gunners have been instructed to clang their muskets 
on the stones to give the impression of great numbers. Suddenly the bandage was taken from the man's eyes, and he found himself in a great hall, standing before the august presence of Frontenac, surrounded by a circle of magnificently dressed officers. The New Englander delivered his message, Phipps' letter demanding surrender. Your prisoners, your persons, your estates, and should you refuse, I am resolved by the help of God in whom I trust to revenge by force of arms all wrongs. As the reading of the letter was finished, the man looked up to see an insolent smile pass round the faces of Frontenac's officers, one of whom superstitiously advised hanging the bearer of such insolence without waste of time. The New Englander pulled out his watch and signaled that he must have Frontenac's answer within an hour. The haughty old governor pretended not to see the motion, and then, with a smile like ice, made answer in words that have become renowned. I shall not keep you waiting so long. Tell your general I do not recognize King William. I know no king of England but King James. Does your general suppose that these brave gentlemen, pointing to his officers, will consent to trust a man who broke his word at Port Royal? As the shout of applause died away, the trembling New Englander asked Frontenac if he would put his answer in writing. No, thundered the old governor, never happier than when fighting. I will answer your general with my cannon. I shall teach him that a man of my rank, with a covert sneer at Phipps' origin, is not to be summoned in such rude fashion. Let him do his best. I shall do mine. It was now the turn of the English to be amazed. This was not the answer they had expected from a fort weakly garrisoned by a hundred men. If they had struck and struck quickly, they might yet have won the day. But all Monday passed in futile arguments and councils of war, and on Tuesday the 17th, towards night, was heard wild shouting within Quebec walls. My faith, messieurs, exclaimed one of the French prisoners aboard Phipps' ship, now you have lost your chance. Those are the couriers de bois from Montreal and the bushrovers of the Pays de Hot, eight hundred strong. The news at last spurred Phipps to action. All that night the people of Quebec could hear the English drilling and shouting, God save King William, with beat of drum and trumpet calls that set the echoes rolling from Cape Diamond, and on the 18th small boats landed 1,400 men to cross the St. Charles River and assault the lower town, while the four largest ships took up position to cannonade the city. It was four in the afternoon before the soldiers had been landed among peppering bullets from the Lemoy bush rovers. Only a few cannon shots were fired, and they did not damage but to kill an urchin of the upper town. Firing began in earnest on the morning of October 19th. The river was churned to fury, and the reverberating echoes set the rocks crashing from Cape Diamond. But it was almost impossible for the English to shoot high enough to damage the upper fort. It was easy for the French to shoot down, and great wounds gaped from the hull of Phipps' ship while his masts went over decks in flame, flag and all. The tide drifted the admiral's flag on shore. The French rowed out, secured the prize, and jubilant shout roared from lower town, to be taken up and echoed and re-echoed from the castle. For two more days bombs roared in mid-air, plunging through the roofs of houses in lower town, or ricocheting back harmless from the rock wall below Castle St. Louis. At the St. Charles, the land forces were fighting blindly to effect a crossing, but the Lemoy bushrovers lying in ambush repelled every advance, though St. Helen had fallen mortally wounded. On the morning of the 21st, the French could hardly believe their senses. The land forces had vanished during the darkness of a rainy night, and ship after ship, sail after sail, 
was drifting downstream was it possible in retreat another week's bombarding would have reduced quebec to flame and starvation but another week would have exposed phipps fleet to wreckage from winter weather and he had drifted down to isle orleans where the dismantled fleet paused to rig up fresh masts it was madame joliet who suggested to the puritan commander in exchange of the prisoners captured at port royal with the english from maine and new hampshire held in quebec she was sent ashore by phipps and the exchange was arranged winter gales assailed the english fleet as it passed anticosti and what with the wrecked and wounded phipps loss totaled not less than a thousand men frontenac had been back in canada only a year and in that time he had restored the prestige of french power in america the iroquois were glad to sue for peace and his bitterness enemies the jesuits joined the merrymakers round the bonfires of acclaim kindled in the old governor's honor as the english retreated and the joy bells pealed out and the procession surged shouting through the streets of quebec from hudson bay to the mississippi from the st lawrence to lake superior and the land of the sioux french power reigned supreme only port nelson high up on the west coast of hudson bay remained subdued draining the furs of the prairie tribes to england away from quebec iberville had captured it in the fall of sixteen ninety four at the cost of his brother chateauguay's life but when iberville departed from hudson bay english men-of-war had come out in sixteen ninety six and wrestled back this most valuable of all the fur posts it was now determined to drive the english forever from hudson bay le moy d'iberville was chosen for the task april sixteen ninety seven seigneury le moy was dispatched from france with five men of war to be placed under the command of iberville at placentia newfoundland whence he was to proceed to hudson bay and to leave not a vestige of the english in the north the frigates left newfoundland july eighth three weeks later they were crushing through the ice jam of hudson straits iberville commanded the pelican with two hundred and fifty men bienneville a brother was on the same ship Seigneur commanded the palmier and there were three other frigates the profound the violent the wasp ice locked round the fleet at the west end of hudson straits and fog lay so thick there was nothing visible of any ship but the masthead for eighteen days they lay crunched and rammed and separated by the ice drive till august twenty fifth early in the morning the fog suddenly lifted iberville saw that sergeny's ship had been carried back in the straits the wasp and violent were not to be seen but straight ahead locked in ice stood the profound and beside the french vessel three english frigates the hampshire the deering the hudson bay on their annual voyage to nelson a lane of water opened before iberville like a bird the pelican spread her wings to the wind and fled september third iberville sighted port nelson and for two days cruised the offing scanning the sea for the rest of his fleet early on september fifth the sails of three vessels heaved and rose above the watery horizon never doubting these were his own ships iberville signalled there was no answer a sailor scrambled to the masthead and shouted down terrified warning these were not the french ships these were the english frigates bearing straight down on the single french vessel commanded by iberville on one side was the enemy's fort on the other the enemy's fleet coming over the waves before a clipping wind all sails set of iberville's crew forty men were ill of scurvy twenty-five had gone ashore to reconnoitre he had left one hundred and fifty fighting men amid a rush of orders 
ropes were strewn across decks for handhold cannon was unplugged and the battery men below decks stripped themselves for the hot work ahead the soldiers assembled on decks sword in hand and the canadian bushrovers stood to the fore ready to leap across the enemy's decks by nine in the morning the ships were abreast and roaring cannonades from the english cut the decks of the pelican to kindling wood and set the mass in flame at the same instant one fell blast of musketry mowed down forty french but iberville's battery man below decks had now ceased to pour a stream of fire into the english hulls the odds were three to one and for four hours the battle raged the english shifting and shearing to lock in death grapple iberville's sharpshooters peppering the decks of the foe it had turned bitterly cold the blood on the decks became ice and each roll of the sea sent wounded and dead weltering from rail to rail such holes had been torn in the hulls of both england and french ships that the gunners below decks were literally looking into each other's smoke grim faces suddenly all hands paused a frantic scream cleft the air the vessels were careening in a temptuous sea for the great ship hampshire had refused to answer to the wheel had lurched had sunk sunk swift as lead among hiss of flames in the roaring sea not a soul of her two hundred and fifty men escaped the frigate hudson's bay surrendered and the deering fled iberville was the victor but a storm now broke in hurricane gusts over the sea iberville steered for land but the waves drenched the wheel at every wash and driving before the storm the pelican floundered in the sands a few miles from nelson all lifeboats had been shot away in such a sea the canadian canoes were useless the shattered masts were tied in four-sided racks to these iberville had the wounded bound and the crew plunged for the shore eighteen men perished going ashore in the darkness on land were two feet of snow no sooner did the french castaways build fires to warm their benumbered limbs than bullets whistled into camp governor bailey of port nelson had sent out his sharpshooters luckily iberville's other ships now joined him and mustering his forces the dauntless french leader marched against the fort storm had permitted the french to land their cannon undetected trenches were cast up and three times surgny le moy was set to demand surrender the french are desperate he urged they must take the fort or perish of want and if you continue the fight there will be no mercy given the hudson's bay people capulated and were permitted to march out with arms bag and baggage an english ship carried the refugees home to the thames the rest of iberville's career is the story of colonizing the mississippi he was granted a vast seigneury on the bay of chaleur and in sixteen ninety nine given a title on his way from the louisiana colony to france his ship had paused at havana here iberville contracted yellow fever and died while yet in the prime of his manhood july ninth seventeen o six after the victory on hudson bay the french were supreme in america and frontenac supreme in new france the old white-haired veteran of a hundred wars became the idol of quebec friends and enemies jesuits and recollects paid tribute to his worth in november of sixteen ninety eight the governor passed from this life in castle st louis at the good old age of seventy eight he had demonstrated demonstrated in action so that his enemies acknowledged the fact that the sterner virtues of the military chieftain go farther towards the making of a great nationhood than soft sentiments and religious emotionalism end of section twenty recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 21 of Canada, the Empire of the North. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott from 1698 to 1713, Part 1. While Frontenac was striking terror into the heart of New England with his French-Canadian bushrovers, the life of the people went on in the same grooves. Spite of a dozen raids on the Iroquois cantons, there was still danger from the warriors of the Mohawk, but the Iroquois braves had found a new stamping ground. Instead of attacking Canada, they now crossed westward to war on the alleys of the French, the tribes of the Illinois and the Mississippi, and with them traveled their liege friends, English traders from New York and Pennsylvania and Virginia. The government of Canada continued to be a despotism, pure and simple. The Supreme Council consisting of the governor, the intendant, the bishop, and a different times from three to twelve councillors stood between the people and the king of france transmitting the king's will to the people and the people's wants to the king and the laws enacted by the council ranged all the way from criminal decrees to such petty regulations as a modern city wardman might pass laws enacted to meet local needs but subject to the veto of an absent ruler who knew absolutely nothing of the local needs exhibited all the absurdities to be expected the king of france desires the sovereign council to discourage the people from using horses which are supposed to cause laziness as it is needful the inhabitants keep up their snowshoe travel so necessary in their wars if in two years the numbers of horses do not decrease they are to be killed for meat then comes a law that reflects the presence of the bishop at the governing board horses have become the pride of the country bow and the gay to be ribboned carrioles are the distraction of the village curé men are forbidden to gallop their horses within a third of a mile from the church on sundays new laws regulations arrests are promulgated by the public crier crying up and down the highway to sound of trumpet and drum chest puffed out with self-importance gold braid enough on the red-coated regalia to overawe the simple habitants though the company is holding monopoly over trade yearly change monopoly is still all-powerful in new france so all persuasive that in seventeen forty one in order to prevent smuggling to defraud the company of the indies it enacted that people using chintz covered furniture must upholster their chairs so that the stamp la de indies will be visible to the inspector the matter of money is a great trouble to new france beaver is coin of the realm on the st lawrence and though this beaver is paid for in french gold the precious metal almost at once finds its way back to france for goods so that the colony is without coin government cards are issued as coin but as europe will not accept card money the result is that gold still flows from new france and the colony is flooded with paper money worthless away from quebec as of old the people may still plead their own cases in lawsuits before the sovereign council but now the privilege of caste and class and feudalism begin to be felt and it is enacted that gentlemen may plead their own cases before the council only when wearing their swords young men are urged to qualify as notaries in addition to the title of sieur baronies are created in canada foremost among them 
that of Le Moyes of Montreal. The feudal seigneur now has his coat of arms emblazoned on the church pew where he worships, on his coach door, and on the stone entrance to his mansion. The habitants are compelled to grind their wheat at his mill, to use his great bake oven, to patronize his tannery. The seigneurial mansion itself is taken on more of pomp. Terry and mahogany furniture have replaced homemade, and the rough cast walls are now covered with imported tapestries. Not gently does a sovereign council deal with delinquents. In 1735 it is enacted of a man who suicided that the corpse be tied to a cart, dragged on a hurdle, head down, face to ground, through the streets of the town, to be hung up by the feet an object of derision, then cast into the river in default of a cesspool. Criminals who evade punishment by flight are to be hanged in effigy. Montreal citizens are ordered to have their chimneys cleaned every month and their houses provided with ladders. Also, the inhabitants of Montreal must not allow their pigs to run in the street and they are forbidden to throw snowballs at each other, and a regulation which people who know Montreal winters will appreciate. They are ordered to make paths through the snow before their houses, to all of which petty regulations did royalty subscribe sign manual. The Treaty of Ryswick closed the war between France and England the year before Frontenac died but it was not known in Canada to 1698. As far as Canada was concerned, it was no peace, barely a truce. Each side was to remain in possession of what it held at the time of the treaty, which meant that France retained all Hudson Bay but one small fort. Though the English of Boston had captured Port Royal, they had left no sign of possession but their flag flying over the tenantless barracks. The French returned from the woods, tore the flag down, and again took possession, so that, by the Treaty of Ryswick, Acadia, too, went back under French rule. Indeed, matters were worse than before the treaty, for there could be no open war, but while English settlers were spreading up from Maine, met French traders wandering down from Acadia, there was the inevitable collision, and it was an easy trick for the rivals to stir up the Indians to raid and massacre and indiscriminate butchery. For Indian raids, neither country would be responsible to the other. The story belongs to the history of the New England frontier rather than to the record of Canada. It is part of Canada's past which few French writers tell, and all Canadians would fain blot out, but which the government records prove beyond dispute. Indian warfare is not a thing of grandeur at its best, but when it degenerates into the braining of children, the bayoneting of women, the mutilation of old men, it is a horror without parallel. And the amazing thing is that the white man who painted themselves as Indians and helped to wage this war, were so sure they were doing God's work that they used to kneel and pray before the beginning of the butchery. To understand it, one has to go back to the Middle Ages in imagination. New France was violently Catholic, New England violently Protestant. Bigotry ever looks out through eyes of John just hatred and in destroying what they thought was a false faith, each side thought itself instrument of God. As for the French governors behind the scenes, who pulled the strings that let loose the hell-dogs of Indian war, they were but obeying the kingcraft of royal master, who would use Indian warfare to add to his domain. The English have sent us presents to drive the black gowns away, declared the Iroquois in 1702, regarding the French Jesuits. 
You did well, writes the King of France to his viceroy in Quebec, to urge the Abenakis of Acadia to raid the English of Boston. The Treaty of Ryswick became known as Quebec towards the end of 1698. The border warfare of ravage and butchery had begun by 1701, the English giving presents to the Iroquois to attack the French of the Illinois, the French giving presents to the Abenakis to raid the New England borders. Quebec offers a reward of twenty crowns for the scalp of every white man brought from the English settlements. New England retaliates by offering twenty pounds for every Indian prisoner under ten years of age, forty pounds for every scalp of full-grown Indian. Presently the young noblesse of New France are off to the woods, painted like Indians, leading crews of wild bush rovers on ambuscade and midnight raid and border foray. We must keep things stirring towards Boston, declared Vaudreuil, the French governor. Midwinter of 1704, Hertel de Roville and his four brothers set out on snowshoes with 51 bush rovers and 200 Indians for Massachusetts. Dressed in buckskin, with musket over shoulder and dagger in belt, the forest rangers course up the frozen river beds southward of the St. Lawrence and on over the height of land towards the Hudson, 250 miles through pine woods and snow padded and silent as death. Two miles from Deerfield the marchers run short of food. It is the last day of February and the sun goes down over rolling snowdrifts high as the slab stockades of the little frontier town where hearth fire smoke hangs low in the frosty air, curling and clouding and lighting to rainbow colors as the ambushed raiders watch from their forest lairs. Snowshoes are laid aside, packs unstrapped, muskets uncased and primed, belts reefed tighter. Twilight gives place to starlight. Candles on the supper tables of the settlement send long gleams across the snow. Then the villagers hold their family prayers, all unconscious that out there in the woods are still bush rovers on bended knees, uttering prayers of another sort. Lights are put out. The village lies wrapped in sleep. Still, Roville's raiders lie waiting, shivering in the snow, till starlight fades to the gray darkness that precedes dawn. Then the bush rovers rise, and at moccasin pace, noiseless as tigers, skim across the snow, over the drifts, over the tops of the palisades, and have dropped into the town before a soul has awakened. There is no need to tell the rest. It was not war. It was butchery. Children were torn from their mother's breast to be brained on the hearthstone. Women were hacked to pieces. Houses were set on fire. And before the sun had risen, thirty-eight persons had been slaughtered, and the French rovers were back on the forest trail, homeward bound with one hundred and six prisoners old and young, women of frail health and children barely able to toddle, were hurried along the trail at Bayonet Point. Those whose strength was unequal to the pace were summarily knocked on the head as they fagged or failed to ford the ice streams. Twenty-four perished, by the way. Of the one hundred and six prisoners scattered as captives among the Indians, not half were ever heard of again. The others were either bought from the Indians by Quebec people whose pity was touched, or placed round in the convents to be converted to the Catholic faith. These were ultimately redeemed by the government of Massachusetts. New England's fury over such a raid in time of peace knew no bounds. Yet how were the English to retaliate? To pursue an ambushed Indian along a forest trail was to follow a vanishing phantom. From earliest times Boston had kept up trade with Port Royal, and of late years Port Royal had been infested with French pirates, 
who raided Boston shipping, Colonel Ben Church of Long Island, a noted bushfighter of gunpowder temper and form so stout that his men had always to hoist him over logs in their forest marches, went storming from New York to Boston with a plan to be revenged by raiding Acadia. Roville's bushrovers had burned Deerfield the first of March. By May, Church had sailed from Boston with six hundred men on two frigates and half a hundred whaleboats on vengeance bent. First he stopped at Baron St. Castin's fort in Maine. St. Castin it was who led the Indians against the English of Maine. The Baron was absent, but his daughter was captured with all the servants, and the fort was burned to the ground. Then up Fundy Bay sailed Church, pausing at Passamaquoddy to knock four Frenchmen on the head, pausing at Port Royal to take eight men prisoners, kill cattle, ravage fields, pausing at Basin of Mines to capture forty habitants, burn the church, and cut the dikes, letting the sea in on the crops, pausing at Bow Basin, the head of Fundy Bay, in August, to set the yellow wheat fields in flames. Then he sailed back to Boston with French prisoners, enough to ensure an exchange for the English held at Quebec. No sooner had English sails disappeared over the sea than the French came out of the woods. St. Castin rebuilt his fort in Maine. The local governor, who had held on with his gates shut and cannon pointed while church ravaged Port Royal village, now strengthened his walls. Acadia took a breath and went on as before, a little world in itself, with the pirate ships slipping in and out, loaded to the waterline with Boston booty, with the buccaneer Bassett throwing his gold round like dust, with the brave soldier Bonaventure losing his head and losing his heart to the painted lady. Widow Frenews, who came from nobody, knew where and lived nobody knew how, and plied her mischief of winning the hearts of other women's husband. She must be sent away, thundered the priest from the pulpit straight at the garrison officer whose heart she dangled as her trophy. She must be sent away, thundered the king's mandate, but the king was in France, and Madame Freneuse wound her charms the tighter round the hearts of the garrison officers, and bid her time to the scandal of the parish and an impotent rage of the priest. Was she vixen or fool, this fair snake woman with the beautiful face, for whose smile the officers risked death and disgrace? Was she spy or adventurous? She signed herself as Widow Freneuse, and had applied to the king for a pension as having grown sons fighting in the Indian Wars. She will come into this story again, snake-like and soft-spoken, and appealing for pity, and fair to look upon, but leaving a trail of blood and treachery and disgrace where she goes. The fur trade of Port Royal at this time was controlled by a family ring of Latours and Charnaises, descendants of the ancient foes, and they lived a life of reckless gaiety, spiced with all the excitement of war and privateering and matrimonial intrigue. Such was the life inside Port Royal. Outside was the quiet peace of a home-loving, home-staying peasantry. Few of the farmers could read or write. The houses were little square Norman cottages. Wood boxes, the commandant called them, with the inevitable porch shaded by the fruit trees now grown into splendid orchards. By diking out the sea, the peasants farmed the marshlands and saved themselves the trouble of clearing the forests. Trade was carried on with Boston and the West Indies. No card money here. The farmers of Acadia demanded coin in gold from the privateers who called for cargo, 
and it is said that in time of such raids as Colonel Church's, great quantities of this gold were carried out by night and buried in huge pots, as much as five thousand Louis d'Ors pounds in one pot, to be dug up after the raiders had departed. Naturally, as raids grew frequent, men sometimes made the mistake of, of digging up other men's pots, and one officer lost his reputation over it. All his knowledge of the outside world, of politics, of religion, the Acadian farmer obtained from his parish priest, and the word of the curé was law. End of section 21. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 22 of Canada, The Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, The Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott. From 1698 to 1713. Part two. Encouraged by Church's success and stung by the raids of French corsairs from Port Royal, New England set herself seriously to the task of conquering Acadia. Colonel March sailed from Boston with 1,000 men and 23 transports, and on June 6, 1707, came into Port Royal. Misfortunes began from the first. March's men were the rawest of recruits fishermen farmers carpenters turned into soldiers unused to military discipline they resisted command a french guardhouse stood at the entrance to port royal basin and fifteen men at once fled to the fort with warning of the english invasion consequently when colonel march and colonel appleton attempted to land their men they were serenaded by the shots of an ambushed foe. Also French soldiers deserted to the English camp with fabulous stories about the strength of the French under Subercase. These yarns ought to have discredited themselves, but they struck terror to the hearts of March's green fighters. Then came St. Castin from St. John River with bushrovers to help Subercase. To the amazement of the French, the English hoisted sail and returned on June 16th, without having fired more than a round of shot. The truth is, March's carpenters and fishermen refused to fight, though reinforcements joined them halfway home, and they made a second attempt on Port Royal in August. March returned to Boston heartbroken, for his name had become a byword to the mob, and he was greeted in the streets with shouts of old wooden sword. While Boston was attempting to wreak vengeance on Acadia for the raiders of Quebec, the bushrovers from the St. Lawrence continued to scourge the outlying settlements of New England. To post soldiers on the frontier was useless. Wherever there were guards, the raiders simply passed on to some unprotected village, and to have kept soldiers along the line of the whole frontier would have required a standing army. Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, northern New York, on the frontier of each reigned perpetual terror, and the fiendish work was a paying business to the pagan Indian, for the Christian white men paid well for all scalps, and ransom money could always be extorted for captives. Barely had the Boston raid on Port Royal failed when Governor de Vaudreuil of Quebec retaliated by turning his raiders loose on Haverhill. The English fleet failed at Port Royal in June. By dawn of Sunday, August 29th, Hertel de Rouville 
had swooped on the English village of Haverhill with one hundred Canadian bushrovers and one hundred and fifty Indians. The story of one raid is the story of all, so this one need not be told. As the raiders were discovered at daylight, the people had a chance to defend themselves, and some of the villagers escaped, the family of one being hidden by a negro nurse under tubs in the cellar. Alarm had been carried to the surrounding settlements, and men rode hot haste in pursuit of the forty prisoners. Hertel de Roville coolly sent back word, if the pursuers did not desist, all the prisoners would be scalped and left on the roadside. Some fifty English had fallen in the fight, but the French lost fifteen, among them young Jared of Verchet, brother of the heroine. The only peace for Massachusetts was the peace that would be a victory, and again New England girded herself to the task of capturing Acadia. It was open war now, for the crowns of England and France were at odds. The troops were commanded by General Francis Nicholson, an English officer who brought out four warships and four hundred trained marines. They were, besides thirty-six transports and three thousand provincial troops, clothed and outfitted by Queen Anne of England, Sunday, September twenty-fourth, 1710. The fleet glides majestically into Port Royal Basin. That night the wind blew a hurricane, and tra the transport Caesar went aground with a crash that smashed her timbers to kindling wood and sent twenty-four men to a watery grave. But General Nicholson gave the raw provincials no time for panic fright. Day dawn, Monday, drums rolling, a martial tread, trumpets blowing, bugles setting, the echoes flying, flags blowing to the wind in the morning sun, he commanded Colonel Vetch to lead the men ashore. Inside Port Royal's palisades, Subercase, the French commander, had less than three hundred men, half that number absolutely naked of clothing, and all short of powder. They were not provisions to last a month, but game to his soul's marrow, as all the warriors of those early days, Subercase put up a brave fight, sending his bombs singing over the heads of the English troops, in vain attempt to baffle the landing. Nicholson retaliated by moving his bomb ship, light of draught, close to the French fort, and pouring a shower of bombs through the roofs of the French fort. Spite of the wreck the night before, by four o'clock Monday afternoon all the English had landed in perfect order and high spirits. Slowly the English forces swung in a circle completely round the fort. Again and again, by daylight and dark, Subercase's naked soldiers rushed, screeching the war whoop, to ambush and stampede the English line. But Nicholson's regulars stood the fire like rocks, and the desperate sortie of the French ended in fifty of Subercase's soldiers deserting en masse to the English. By Friday Nicholson's guns were all mounted in place to bombard the little wooden fort. Subercase was desperate. Women and children from the settlement had crowded into the fort for protection and were now crazed with fear by the bursting bombs, while the naked soldiers could be kept on the walls only at the sword point of their commanding officers. For two hundred French to have held out longer against three thousand five hundred English would have been madness. Subercase made the presence of the women in Port Royal an excuse to send a messenger with flag of truce across to Nicholson, asking the English to take the women under their protection. Nicholson might well have asked what protection the French raiders had accorded the women of the New England frontiers, but he sent back polite answer that, as he was not warring on women and children, he would receive them in the English camp, meanwhile holding Supercase's messenger prisoner, as he had entered the English camp without warning, eyes abound, Sunday, October 1st. 
the English bombs again being began singing overhead. Superkey sends word he will capitulate if given honorable terms. For a month the parleying continues. Then November 13th the terms are signed on both sides, the English promising to furnish ships to carry the garrison to some French port and pledging protection to the people of the settlement. November 14th the French officers and their ladies come across to the English camp and breakfast in pomp with the English commanders. Seventeen New England captives are haled forth from Port Royal dungeons, all in rags, without shirts, shoes, or stockings. On the 16th, Nicholson draws his men up in two lines, one on each side of Port Royal gates, and the two hundred French soldiers marched out saluting Nicholson as they passed to the transports. On the bridge, halfway out, French officers meet the English officers, doff helmets, and present the keys to the fort. For the last time Port Royal changes hands. Henceforth it is English, and in gratitude for the Queen's help, Nicholson renamed the place, as it is known today, Annapolis. Among the raiders capitulating is the famous bushrover Baron St. Castine of Maine. When Nicholson returned to Boston, all New England went mad with delight. Thanksgiving services were held, joy bells rang day and night for a week, and bonfires blazed on village commons, to the gleeful shoutings of rustic soldiers returned to the home settlements glorified heroes. At Annapolis, Port Royal, Paul Mascarin, a French Huguenot of Boston, has mounted guard with two hundred and fifty New England volunteers. Colonel Vetch is nominally the English governor, but Vetch is in Boston the most of the time, and is on Mascarin the burden of governing falls. His duties are not light. Palisades have been broken down and must be repaired. Bombs have torn holes in the fort roofs, and all that winter the rain leaks in as though a sieve. The soldier volunteers grumble and mope and sicken, and these are not the least of Paul Mascarin's troubles. French priests minister to the Acadian farmers outside the fort, to the sinister Indians ever lying in ambush to the French bushrovers under young St. Castin across Fundy Bay on St. John River. Not for love or money can Mascarin buy provisions from the Acadians. Not by threats can he compel them to help mend the breaches in the palisades. The young commandant was only twenty-seven years of age, but he must have guessed whence came the unspoken hostility the first miserable winter wears slowly past, and the winter of 1711 is setting in, with the English garrison even more poverty-stricken than the year before, when there drifts into Annapolis Basin, in a birch canoe paddled by a New Brunswick Indian, a white woman with her little son. She has come, she says, from the north side of Fundy Bay, because the French on St. John River are starving. Whether the story be true or false matters little. It was the widow Freneus, the snake women of mischief-making witchery, who had woven her spells round the officers in the days of the French at Port Royal. True or false, her story, added to her smile, excited sympathy, and she was welcomed to the shelter of the fort. It had been almost impossible for the English to obtain trees to repair the walls of the fort, and seventy English soldiers were sent out secretly by night to paddle up the river in a whaleboat for timber. Who conveyed secret warning of this expedition to the French bush raiders outside? No doubt the fair spy, widow for news could have told if she would, but five miles from Port Royal, where the river narrowed to a place ever since known as Bloody Brook, 
a crash of musket shots flared from the woods on each side painted indians and frenchmen dressed as indians among whom was a son of widow Frenu's, dashed out sixteen english were killed nine wounded the rest to a man captured to be held for ransoms ranging from ten pounds to fifty pounds oddly enough the very night after the attack before news of it had come to annapolis the widow Frenu's disappears from the fort henceforth paul mascarene's men kept guard night and day and slept in their boots even like a sinister shadow of evil moved st castin and his raiders through the arcadian wildwoods only one thing prevented the french recapturing port royal at this time all troops were required to defend quebec itself from invasion nicholson's success at port royal spurred england and her american colonies to a more ambitious project to capture quebec and subjugate canada this time nicholson was to head twenty five hundred provincial troops by way of lake champlain to the st lawrence while a british army of twelve thousand half soldiers half marines on fifteen frigates and forty-six transports was to sail from boston for quebec the navy was under command of, of sir hovender walker the army of general jack hill a court favorite of queen anne's more noted for his graces than his prowess the whole expedition is one of the most disgraceful in the annals of english war the fleet left boston on july thirtieth seventeen eleven nicholson meanwhile waiting encamped on lake champlain early in august the immense fleet had rounded sable island and was off the shores of anticosti though there was no good pilot on board the two commanders nightly went to bed and slept the sleep of the just off egg islands on the night of august twenty second there was fog and a strong east wind walker evidently thought he was near the south shore ignorant of the strong undertow of the tide here which had carried his ships thirty miles off course the water was rolling in the lumpy masses of a choppy cross sea when a young captain of the regulars dashed breathlessly into walker's stateroom and begged him for the lord's sake to come on deck for there are reefs ahead and we shall all be lost with a seaman's laugh and a landsman fears the admiral donned dressing gown and slippers and shuffled up to the decks a pale moon had broken through the ragged fog rack and through the white light they plainly saw mountainous breakers straight ahead walker shouted to let anchor go and drive to the wind above the roar of breakers and trample of panic-stricken seamen over deck could be heard the minute guns of the other ships firing for help then pitch darkness fell with slant rains in a deluge the storm abated but all night long above the boom of an angry sea could be heard shrieks and shoutings for help and by the light of the admiral's ship could be seen the faces of the dead cast up by the moil of the sea before dawn eight transports had suffered shipwreck and one thousand lives were lost it was a night to put fear in the hearts of all but very brave men and neither walker nor hill proved man enough to stand firm to the shock walker ascribed the loss to the storm and the storm to providence and when war council was held three days later jack hill the court dandy was only too glad of excuse to turn tail and flee to england without firing a gun poor old nicholson waiting with his provincials up on lake champlain goes into apoplexy with tempest of rage and chagrin when he hears the news stamping the ground tearing off his wig and shouting rogues rogues he burns his fort and disbands his men the peace of utrecht in seventeen thirteen 
for the time closed the war. France had been hopelessly defeated in Europe, and the terms were favorable to England. All the Hudson Bay was to be restored to the English, but, note well, it was not specified where the boundaries were to be between Hudson Bay and Quebec that boundary dispute came down as a heritage to modern days thanks to the incompetency and ignorance of the statesmen who arranged the treaty acadia was given to england but cape breton was retained by the french and note well it was not stated whether acadia included new brunswick and maine as the french formerly contended or included only the peninsula south of the bay of fundy that boundary dispute, too, came down. Newfoundland was acknowledged as an English possession, but the French retained the islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon, with fishing privileges on the shores of Newfoundland. That concession, too, has come down to trouble modern days, thanks to the same defenders of colonial interests. The Iroquois were acknowledged to be subjects of England, but it was not stated whether that concession included the lands of the Ohio raided and subrogated by the Iroquois, and the vagueness was destined to cost both New France and New England some of its best blood. It has been stated, and stated many times without dispute, that when England sacrificed the interests of her colonies in boundary settlements, she did so because she was in honor bound to observe the terms of treaties one is constrained to ask whose ignorance was responsible for the terms of those treaties looking back on the record so far both of france and england which has spent the more both of substance and of life for defense the mother countries or the colonies end of section twenty two Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 23 of Canada, the Empire of the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Canada, the Empire of the North by Agnes C. Lott From 1713 to 1755, Part 1 What with clandestine raids and open wars, it might be thought that the little nation of New France had vent enough for the buoyant energy of its youth. While the population of the English colonies was nearing the million mark, New France had not 60,000 inhabitants by 1759. Yet what had the little nation, whose mainspring was at Quebec, accomplished? Look at the map! Her bushrovers had gone overland to Hudson Bay, far north as Nelson. Before 1700, Duluth had forts at Kamisqua, near modern Fort Williams, on Lake Superior, Radisson, Marquette, Joliet, and La Salle had blazed a trail to the Mississippi from what is now Minnesota to the Gulf of Mexico. By 1701, Lamont Cadillac had built what is now Detroit in order to stop the progress of the English traders up the lakes to Michimackinac, and by 1727, the company of the Sioux had forts far west as Lake Pepin. With Quebec as the hub of the wheel, draw spokes across the map of North America. Where do they reach? From Quebec to the Gulf of Mexico, to the Missouri, to the upper Mississippi, to Lake Superior, to Hudson Bay. Who blazed the way through these far pathless wilds? nameless wanderers dressed in rags and tatters, outcasts of society, forest rovers lured by the unknown as by a siren, soldiers of fortune, penniless in debt, heartbroken, slandered, persecuted, driven by the demon of their own genius to earth's ends and to ruin. 
spite of clandestine raids and open wars new france was now setting herself to stretch the lines of her discoveries farther westward it will be remembered it was at three rivers that the indians of the up country paused on their way down the st lawrence from the days of radisson in sixteen sixty the passion for discovery had been in the very air of three rivers in this little fort was born in sixteen eighty six pierre gallier varennes de la Vrendry, son of a french officer from childhood the boy's ear must have been accustomed to the uncouth babblings of the half-naked indians whose canoes came swarming down the river soon as ice broke up in the spring one can guess that in his play the boy many a time simulated indian voyager bush rover coming home clad in furs the envy of the villagers at fourteen young pierre had decided that he would be a great explorer but destiny for the time ruled otherwise at eighteen he was among the bush raiders of new england nineteen found him fighting the english in newfoundland then came the honor coveted by all canadian boys an appointment to the king's army in europe young the verendry was among the french forces defeated by the great marlborough but the peace of the utrecht sent him back to canada aged twenty seven to serve in the far northern fur post of nepigon eating his heart out with ambition it was here the dreams of his childhood emerged like a commanding destiny old indian chief ochaga drew maps on birch bark of a trail to the western sea la Verendie took canoe for quebec and with heart beating to the passion of a secret ambition laid the drawings before the governor beauharnois he came just in the nick of time english traders were pressing westward new france lent ready ear for schemes of wider empire the court could grant no money for discoveries but it gave la vendere permission for a voyage and monopoly in furs over the lands he might discover but the lands must be found before there would be furs and here became the mundane worries of la vendre's glory montreal merchants outfitted him but that meant debt and his little party of fifty grizzled wood rovers set out with their ninety-foot birch canoes from montreal on june eighth seventeen thirty one three sons were in his party and a nephew jim murray from the sioux country of the west every foot westward had been consecrated by heroism to set the pulse of red-blooded men jumping there was the seigneury of la chine named in the decision of la salle's project to find a path to china there was the long salt where dollard had fought the iroquois there were the pink granite islands of georgian pay where the jesuits had led their harried hurons there was michilmac with the brawl of its vice and brandy and lawless traders from the woods where la motte cadillac ruled before going to found detroit seventy-eight days from montreal there were the pictured rocks of lake superior purple and silent and deep as ocean which radisson had coasted on his way to the mississippi then the verdurae came to Duluth's old stamping ground kamaisquia the homebound boats were just leaving the fur posts for the st lawrence frost had already stripped the trees of foliage and winter would presently lock all avenues of retreat in six months ice la vendre's men began to doubt the wisdom of chasing a will o the wisp to an unknown western sea the explorer sent half the party forward with his nephew jim Murray, and his son jean while he himself remained at kamaisquia with the mutineers to forage for provisions winter found jemmeray's men on the minnesota side of rainy lake 
where they built Fort Pierre and drove a rich trade in furs with the encamped Crees. In summer of 1732 came La Vendre, his men in grayest apparel marching before the awestruck Crees with bugle blowing and flags flying. Then white men and Crees advanced in canoes to the Lake of the Woods, coasting from island to island through the shadowy defiles of the sylvan rocks along the Minnesota shore to the northwest angle. Here a second winter witnessed the building of a second post, Fort St. Charles, with four rows of fifteen-foot palisades and thatched-roofed log cabins. The western sea seemed far as ever, like the rainbow of the child, ever fleeing as pursued, and La Vendere's merchant partners were beginning to curse him for a rainbow chaser. He had been away three years, and there were no profits. Suspicious that he may be defrauding them by private trade or sacrificing their interests to his own ambitions, they failed to send forward provisions for this year. La Vendre was in debt to his men for three years' wages, in debt to his partners for three years' provisions. To fail now he dared not. Go forward he could not, so he hurried down to Montreal, where he prevailed on the merchants to continue supplies by the simple argument that, if they stopped now, there would be total loss. Young Jean La Vendre and Gemeray have meanwhile descended Winnipeg River's white fret of waterfalls to Winnipeg Lake, where they build Fort Marupas near modern Alexander, and wait. Fishing failed. The hunt failed. The winter of 1735 to 1736 proved of such terrible severity that famine stalked through the western woods. La Vendre's three forts were reduced to diet of skins, moccasin soup, and dog meat. In desperation, Jean Marie set out with a few voyagers to meet the returning commander, but privation had undermined his strength. He died on the way and was buried in his hunter's blanket beside an unknown stream between Lake Winnipeg and Lake of the Woods. Accompanied by the priest, all know, young Jean de la Vendre decided to rush canoes down from the Lake of the Woods to Michilmackinac for food and powder. A furious pace was to be kept all the way to Lake Superior. The voyageurs had risen early one morning in June, and after paddling some miles through the mist, had landed to breakfast, when a band of marauding suit fell on them with a shout. The priest, all new, fell pierced in the head by a stone-pointed arrow. Young Jean Le Vendre was literally hacked to pieces. Not a man of the seventeen French escaped and Massacre Island became a place of ill omen to the French from that day. At last came the belated supplies, and by February of 1737, Le Vendre had moved his main forces west to Lake Winnipeg. This was no western sea, though the wind whipped the lake like a tide, which explained the Indian legend of an inland ocean. Though it was no western sea, it was a new empire for France. The born of the unknown still fled like the rainbow, and La Vendre still pursued. Down to Quebec for more supplies with tales of a vast beyond land. Back to Lake Winnipeg by September 1738 with canoes gliding up the muddy current of the Red River for the unknown land of the Assiniboine, past Nettie Creek, then known as Massacre Creek, or Murderer's River, from the Sioux having slain the encamped wives and children of the Cree who had gone to Hudson Bay with their furs, between the wooded banks of what are now East and West Selkirk, flat to left, high to right, tracking up the rapids of St. Andrews, thick oak woods to east 
rippling prairie russet in the autumn rolling to the west la Vendrée and his voyageurs came to the forks of red river and the assiniboine or what is now known as the city of winnipeg where the two rivers met on the flats to the west were the high scaffoldings of an ancient cree graveyard bizarre and eerie and ghost-like between the voyageurs and the setting sun on the high river bank of what is now known as assiniboine avenue gleamed the white skin of ten cree tepees where two war chiefs waited to meet la vendre drawing up their canoes near where the bridge now spans between st boniface and winnipeg the voyageurs came ashore it was a fair scene that greeted them such a scene as any westerner may witness to-day of a warm september night when the sun hangs low like a blood-red shield and the evening breeze touches the rustling grasses of the prairie beyond the city to the waves of an ocean it was not the western sea but it was a sea of prairie it was a new world unbounded by hill or forest spacious as the very airs of heaven fenced only by the blue dip of a shimmering horizon it was a world through the vendre knew it not five times larger than new france half as big as all europe he had discovered the canadian northwest one can guess how the tired wanderers at rest beneath the uptilted canoes that night wondered whither their quest would lead them over the fire-dyed horizon where the sun was sinking as over a sea the cree chiefs told them of other lands and other peoples to the south who trade with a people who dwell on the great waters beyond the mountains of the setting sun the spaniards leaving men to knock up a trading post near the suburb now known as fort rouge la vendre on september twenty sixth steers his canoes up the shallow assiniboine as far as what is now known as portage la prairie where a trail leads overland to the saskatchewan and so down the, to the english traders of hudson bay but this is not the trail to the western sea la vendre's quest is set towards those people who live on the great waters to the south fort de la reine is built at the portage of the prairie and october eighteenth to beat of drum with flag flying la vendre marches forth with fifty-two men towards sorry river for the land of the mandanes on the missouri december third he is welcomed to the mandane villages but here is no western sea only the broad current of the missouri rolling turbulent and muddy southward toward the mississippi but the mundanes tell of a people to the far west who live on the great waters bitter for drinking whose dress in armor and dwell in stone houses these must be the spaniards la vendre's quest has become a receding phantom leaving men to learn the missouri dialects la vendre marched in the teeth of midwinter storms back to the portage of the prairie on the assiniboine of that march space forbids to tell a blizzard raged driving the fine snows into eyes and skin like hot salt when the marchers camped at night they had to bury themselves in snow to keep from freezing drifts covered all landmarks the men lost their bearings doubled back on their own tracks were frostbitten buffeted by the storm and short of food christmas was passed in the camps of wandering assiniboines and february tenth seventeen thirty nine the fifty men staggered weak and starving back to portage of the prairie the wanderings of la vendre and his sons for the next few years led southwestward as far as the rockies in the region of montana 
northwestward for as the Bow River branch of the Saskatchewan. Meanwhile, all La Vendre's property had been seized by his creditors. Jealous rivals were clamoring for possession of his fur posts. The king had conferred on him the Order of the Cross of St. Louis, but eighteen years of exposure and worry had broken the explorer's health. On the eve of setting out again for the west, he died suddenly on the 6th of December, 1749, at Montreal. Look again at the map. The spokes of the wheel running out from Quebec extend to the Gulf of Mexico on the south, to the Rockies on the west, to Hudson Bay on the north, and the population of New France does not yet number 60,000 people. Is it any wonder French Canadians look back on these days as the Golden Age? And while the bushrovers of Canada are pushing their way through the wilderness westward, there come slashing, tramping, swearing, stamping through the mountainous wilds of West and East Siberia, the Cossack soldiers of Peter the Great, led by the Dane, Vitus Bering bound on discovery to the west coast of America. La Vendre's men have crossed only half a continent. Bering's Russians cross the width of two continents, 7,000 miles, then launch their crazily planked ships over unknown northern seas for America. From 1729 to August 1742 toil the Russian sea voyagers. Their story is not part of Canada's history. Suffice to say, December 1741 finds the Russian crews cast away on two desert islands of Bering Sea, west of Alaska, now known as the Commander Islands. Half the crew of 77 perish of starvation and scurvy. Bering himself lies dying in a sandpit, with the earth spread over him for warmth. Outside the sand holes where the Russians crouch scream hurricane gales and white billows and myriad sea birds. The ships have been wrecked. The Russians are on an unknown island. Day dawn, December 8th, lying half buried in the sand, bearing breeze his last. On rafts made of wreckage, the remnant of his crew find way back to Asia but they have discovered a trail across the sea to a new land. Fur hunters are moving from the east, westward. Fur hunters are moving from the west, eastward. These two tides will meet and clash at a later era. The Treaty of Utrecht had stopped open war, but that did not prevent the bushrovers from raiding the borderlands of Maine, of Massachusetts, of New York. The story of one raid is the story of all, and several have already been related. Now comes a half-century of petty war that raged on the borderlands from Saratoga and Northfield to Maine and New Brunswick. The story of these little wars, as the French called them, belongs more to the history of the United States than Canada. Nor did the peace of Utrecht stop the double dealing and intrigue by which european rulers sought to use bigoted missionaries and ignorant indians as pawns in the game of statecraft sentiments of opposition to the english in acadia must be secretly fostered commanded the king of france in seventeen fifteen two years after acadia had been deeded over to england the king is pleased with the efforts of Pere Rassel to induce the Indians not to allow the English to settle on their lands, runs the Royal Dispatch of 1721 regarding the border massacres of Maine. Advise the missionaries in Acadia to do nothing that may serve as a pretext for sending them out of the country, but have them induce the Indians to organize enterprises against the English command the royal instructions of 1744. 
the indians writes the canadian governor can be depended on to bring in the scalps of the english as long as we furnish ammunition this is the opinion of the missionary monsieur le lotre again from the governor of new france if the settlers of acadia hesitate to rise against their english masters we can employ threats of the indians and force it is inconceivable that the english would try to remove these people letters from monsieur le lotre report that his indians have intercepted dispatches of the english officers monsieur le lotre will keep us informed of everything in acadia we have furnished him with secret signals to our ships which will tell us of every movement on the part of the enemy of all the hotbeds of intrigue acadia from its position had become the worst here was a population of french farmers which in half a century had increased to twelve thousand held in subjection by an english garrison at annapolis of less than two hundred soldiers so destitute they had neither shoes nor stockings coats nor bedding the french were guaranteed in the treaty of utrecht the freedom and privileges of their religion by the english but in matters temporal as well as spiritual they were absolutely subject to priests acting as spies for the quebec plotters france as has been told retained cape breton isle royal and prince edward island isle st jean and the treaty of utrecht had hardly been signed before plans were drawn on magnificent scale for a french fort on cape breton to effect threefold purpose to command the sea towards boston to regain acadia to protect the approach to the river st lawrence the island of cape breton is like a hand with its fingers stuck out in the sea the very tip of a long promontory commanding one of the southern arms of the sea was chosen for the fort that was to be the strongest in all america on three sides were the sea with outlying islands suitable for powerful batteries and a harbor entrance that was both narrow and deep to the rear was impassable muskeg quaking moss above water-soaked bog two weaknesses only had the fort there were hills to the right and left from which an enemy might pour destruction inside the walls but the royal engineers of france depended on the outlying island batteries preventing any enemy gaining possession of these hills by seventeen twenty walls thirty-six feet thick had encircled an area of over one hundred acres outside the rear wall had been excavated a ditch forty feet deep and eighty wide bristling from the six bastions of the walls were more than one hundred and eighty heavy cannon beside the two batteries commanding the entrance to the harbor was an outer royal battery of forty cannon directly across the water from the fort on the next finger of the island twenty years was the fort in building costing what in those days was regarded as an enormous sum of money equal to ten million dollars such was louisburg impregnable as far as human foresight could judge the refuge of corsairs that preyed on boston commerce the haven of the schemers who intrigued to wean away the acadians from english rule the guardian sentinel of all approach to the st lawrence it would be well wrote the king the very next year after the treaty was signed to attract the acadians to keep breton but act with caution and now twenty years had passed some acadians had gone to cape breton and others to prince edward island but statecraft judged the simple acadian farmer would be more useful where he was on the spot in acadia ready to rebel when open war would give the french of louisbourg a chance to invade 
End of section 23. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.